Thank you. Uh, it's really a delight to be here in Athens. Uh, this is my third trip here, and every time it gets better. So today I'm going to um, talk to you about the journey uh, from my early days to uh, MC10. Uh, the Start Smart uh, organizers asked me to paint a picture of exactly how it was to get from where I started to the endpoint, which is MC10 right now. And to do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about my childhood and essentially where my passion for uh, technology and engineering got started and then grow from there through uh, my, my course through MIT and um, to MC10. And uh, it really begins uh, early on. Um, soon after you know, playing with Legos, I was uh, really inspired by uh, some of the uh, tribulations that my brother, uh, who is visually impaired, uh, had to overcome when he was a kid. Um, seeing how he learned Braille um, and was able to adapt, and his hearing was just uh, pretty fantastic uh, in terms of its selectivity with frequencies and being able to have perfect pitch. And I was very inspired by this, and uh, er later on in life, I became very interested in understanding how our sensors work, so our ability to see, our vision, tactile abilities to be able to sense for Braille. Uh, speech, which is uh, very connected to our sense of uh, auditory. Uh, if you can't hear, you can't formulate speech at an early age, and it becomes very critical to be able to wear a, um, a cochlear implant. And so early on, um, I was very interested in doing uh, different projects. As you'll see on the left, uh, I was uh, developing things like robots that were autonomous and they could paint uh, for uh, abstract art, for example, and then later on in life, um, started to uh, develop a, a sense of uh, a purpose around engineering. And in order to do that, I grew up in Los Angeles, which you can see is not much different than the climate here. Uh, but to do that, you really needed to go uh, seek out uh, the best places to develop that skill. And the biggest, baddest engineering schools out there, uh, the top of the list was MIT. And notice the weather in December in Los Angeles versus in Boston, you'll notice uh, there's a lot of perseverance and persistence to be able to overcome that uh, change. And uh, so I went to MIT as an undergrad. And uh, really, uh, persistence and, and passion take you so far. The other things that you have to develop as an engineer or scientist is the ability to uh, uh, invent and engineer. Uh, and so you need the foundations. Um, from an early uh, development process. And so at MIT, I started to, to take uh, electrical engineering courses, biology classes, and really wanted to develop a foundation around um, sensory deficits and things like retinal implants. Uh, there's a big project at MIT that's happening. Uh, auditory systems. How do you develop systems that could help people hear, see, touch? Um, and so if you chart from MIT uh, in order to take a step further, I needed to go to grad school. And so to do that, um, I applied to a, a, a translational program between Harvard Med School and MIT, um, which really focused on how do we take technology from the bench, which is in the lab setting, to the hospital setting. And that's really what changed my life. I was actually uh, really interested in engineering, but then once the, the, the side on the biology came, came together, it really made a lot of sense and really set the stage for uh, the next steps uh, in life. And so, uh, but you can't really uh, do all of this on your own. You really need uh, supporters, um, champions for your cause to be there uh, to uh, essentially show you the ropes whenever uh, you, you hit a wall. And so, uh, to the, the really key players uh, during my uh, college, grad school, and now MC10 career has, have been uh, these two gentlemen. Uh, both of them are professors. Um, on the left is Professor Dennis Freeman. He's a professor at MIT, electrical engineering. He's also dean of undergraduate education at MIT, given his, uh, his passion for teaching at the undergraduate level. Um, and then on the right side, um, you have Professor John Rogers, who's a co-founder of MC10, who's really uh, been a, an amazing advisor to me over the years. And so if you look at these two worlds, uh, they're different. Uh, on the left, you have Professor Freeman, who's very much a scientist, he's not necessarily an entrepreneur, but very uh, big on invention, as well as understanding mechanisms around how we hear, how we see. 
Um, and then on the right is the entrepreneur side of my development um, and Professor John Rogers, who is a professor, but he's spun out n several companies. And so I, f I have fed off of these two individuals in, in a very uh, important sort of way, and it's led to uh, leveraging off of the network around me as well. And so you'll see the um, MIT 100K logo. That's essentially what uh, triggered me down this path of doing um, entrepreneurship and shifting from doing work in the lab to something uh, that could be um, important to society. Um, and the MIT 100K, as many other uh, entrepreneurship contests that may be happening in Greece, have that ability to inspire. And that really triggered and pivoted me in the right direction. And so once you get through all the schooling and you do all of this work, it's really important to pick the right problems. And a lot of the speakers have talked about that. How do you actually uh, pick a challenge and solve it that's meaningful? Because there's a lot of problems out there. So you need to really pick a problem that's important to society. And so the problem that we've picked, uh, and which is the, the backdrop for MC10, is this notion that electronics are hard, rigid, flat, and your body is soft, flexible, and curvy. Simple. So how do you merge these two worlds? Biology is here. Electronics are here. How do you bring them together? And the concept uh, is just laid out in this simple uh, uh, set of images here. If you look at a block of wood, it's pretty rigid. Um, you, could, you can't bend it. Uh, but if you thin it down and reorient it, you get something as fine and fragile and soft as tissue paper, which is bendable, which is uh, very uh, conformal. Similar type of principle in mechanics applies to silicon. Silicon uh, is something that's very brittle. It's like glass. Uh, but if you thin it down from about a millimeter down to nanometers, what you end up with is this very slinky-like uh, picture of silicon, which is very uh, stretchable and flexible. And so that's the, the real uh, inspiration behind MC10. So how do we take that technology, which is a very material-centric type of innovation, and be able to apply it and adapt it to, to uh, important problems in the world? And to do that, what we've uh, focused on is doing research around uh, putting these electronics on the skin. So imagine you have sensors that could thermally map your, your skin surface temperature or uh, map your activity, as a lot of companies are doing these days. And you could wear them in such a way that it's like laminated on your skin, um, like saran wrap. Similarly, you could build hydration sensors or or electrodes that could sense and map different electrophysiological activities, all at this very fine scale that you could wrinkle your skin and the electronics will wrinkle with, with it and still perform. And ultimately, even if you fast forward after uh, five years of MC10 life and before that, 10 years of tech development that went into uh, the lab in the university setting, we're still innovating. We still publish papers in um, these uh, research journals like Nature Nanotech around how do we build these next generation of sensors. And as a startup company that's uh, venture funded, as a company that's always on the brink, we're always looking to innovate and publish and get our work out there, as well as patent and uh, get um, intellectual property around it. So you can see here, this is a, a sample of the latest things that we're developing, which integrate the sensors along with the therapy so that you could do drug delivery uh, along with uh, the, the diagnostics that you could do on skin for, say, uh, patients with Parkinson's disease. And so this isn't out in the market yet, but it's something that uh, we see as a future, and we're working with pharmaceutical companies down the road, as I'll describe. Uh, so that's kind of the backdrop of the research that happened at um, the university level, and then ultimately led to the founding of MC10. So how do we take that uh, research and then make it into something that's interesting as a business. And so we take uh, this type of pitch. So MC10, we take rigid high performance electronics and we turn them into this, which is uh, this stretchable, very flexible, bendy thing. So what's that good for? It looks cool, but how do we uh, actually adapt it to things? Well, turns out uh, timing is everything. So today we're in a world where people, a lot of people probably in the audience have um, wearable devices. They're usually on the wrist. So you wear it and you track activity. There's several companies like Samsung, Apple, Google who are investing in the future of wearables. And, 
as a company that's working on epidermal electronics, we took note of this. And um, really, a lot of people have a lot of forecasts, and you know, you'll, you'll see this sort of data all around. Everyone thinks it's going to be big, but no one knows how big, so there's a lot of fluffy uh, numbers out there that say wearables is going to be a, a big thing, but ultimately it's still a work in progress and we as well as other people in this space are trying to figure out where to take it. And uh, so we started on that path. So this is actually our first product. Uh, it's called the MC10 check light. It's a, it's a head mounted um, sensing system uh, that senses uh, impact. So you can imagine a football player American football player or a hockey player who's wearing um, this sort of check light, uh, being able to uh, sense and monitor the, the extent of impact could tell you and warn you whether or not there will be a concussion. So this is worn within uh, a beanie that's uh, sponsored by Reebok. That's a company that we collaborated with on this partnership. And this is a product out in the market. So this was our first foray into building a product that includes some of these wearable concepts that I just described. But ultimately, we, we have systems that could go anywhere on the body to collect sensor data such as heart rate, um, activity, respiration. All of these are uh, essentially um, signals that we'd like to collect from different regions and parts of the body. Given the form factor, you could place it anywhere. And so that, that's really where we're going in terms of problem solving, but uh, ultimately you need partners and uh, I completely agree with uh, the other folks who came up here. Uh, it's really important to get the strategic partnerships and development arrangements so that you can start to collect money that does not tax your equity. And so uh, what we've done is uh, we've targeted three different areas. So sports, consumer health, as well as um, medical products uh, where we're developing products in partnership with other uh, companies, usually big companies like big pharma companies. And uh, the way we do that is we develop a lot of the hardware and the infrastructure, but they provide the clinical support, the sales distribution, the marketing, which uh, we uh, don't necessarily uh, uh, have an expertise in. And what you end up with are these arrangements like with Reebok where we launch a product that has uh, our hardware integrated with their clothing apparel. Uh, similarly, uh, with companies like UCB Pharma, which is in Belgium, uh, they, they develop uh, drugs for Parkinson's disease and epilepsy. We develop the sensors that they can then couple with their pill therapies, with their drugs. And so you can give drugs to patients who have Parkinson's and then monitor and track their tremor, their gait, their uh, ability to walk and balance with, with our devices. And so it's very critical to be able to track how uh, these patients are able to um, uh, adapt to the dosage that they get such that um, you can tune it uh, in, a, in, in a very specific person-to-person -person way as opposed to just giving everyone the same medication. You could do that if you can fit patients with these wearable devices that they could wear anywhere. And ultimately, uh, it's really critical, as others have pointed, uh, to have this type of platform to be able to communicate that information to your phone and then ultimately to a server somewhere to be able to collect that data and build and, and watch uh, how your population of patients is, uh, is adapting and growing with the drugs. These are the, the two areas as a company, as a startup, small company, we've uh, focused in on to, to really make an impact. There's a lot of areas in medicine where you can imagine wearables having a, a, a big impact. Uh, heart failure is one that a lot of companies are going after, uh, big companies as well as small. Uh, but ultimately, we focused on uh, these, these focus areas like sleep disorders, um, restless leg, um, neuromuscular disease, because they all exploit the same underlying sensors and technology. And so what we're able to do is bring this technology to the home and watch uh, patients uh, take it, uh, the, their, their pill and drug dosages, and then be able to uh, wear these sensors and collect a ton of data that could then feed back information to the doctors, the physicians, and the patients themselves. So that, that uh, covers a lot of uh, the, the journey that I've taken up till now. Uh, so strategic partnerships are very important and we'd like to uh, be able to grow that even further. That's where MC10 is, but ultimately uh, you can't get anywhere without people who are able to not only develop but help advance uh, the technology. So as a member of the founding team of MC10, we started with a very 
um, a tight-knit group of uh, original engineers, but we ultimately uh, had to grow. And one of the ways to grow, it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy, is to be able to uh, uh, be recognized and publish and get uh, accolades in technology, uh, press, as well as um, places where you get innovation recognition. And that's really helped us bring more talent on board. So the technology review uh, has uh, identified MC10 as one of the disruptive companies. That helps us bring uh, more people. And in Boston, where there's a lot of competition for talent, um, it's really important to, to uh, have inroads to these uh, different uh, engineers as well as marketing and business development people. So we, uh, we leverage a lot of our resources to do that and are always on the cutting edge to, to be able to bring new talent. And if you look at MC10 today, we're about 50 people. Um, most of them are engineers and scientists, uh, but we surround ourselves with a team of uh, marketing and business development people to uh, be able to tackle the right areas of focus within pharmaceutical, uh, medical device, as well as uh, consumer health. And uh, uh, we're based out in uh, Cambridge. Uh, you can see uh, the, the team has been growing, and it's uh, essentially uh, due to a lot it has a lot to do with the, the Boston ecosystem, but also uh, with the ability to uh, advance technology. You just have more people who are interested coming in. Uh, and so just to wrap up, I'd like to end with, um, you know, we started with this vision of taking things that are hard, rigid, and flat and merging them with biology, which is soft, flexible, and curvy. Uh, it doesn't stop with wearables. I think for us, um, it's really... Uh, a fundamental problem that we'd like to solve, and we're starting with these skin-mounted systems that you could wear anywhere on the body. But the same class of technology could be applied to putting sensors onto the heart, such as for a pacemaker, or on a catheter, um, or even on the surface of the brain to map neural activity and seizures. And so that, that DNA of doing innovation and technology never subsides. It's something that we keep going with our university uh, collaborations as well as kind of the future roadmap. Not the two year or the five year vision, but the 10 year or five to 10 year vision as we go forward. And so we consider that to be the future of bioelectronics going forward. Thank you.